Hello everyone. We're going to start the second chapter of Mary Stewart's Thorny Hole today. I'll go ahead and do the same thing I had done for the last chapter, which is describe to you the pen and ink drawing at the start of this chapter. It looks like a rickety old well. The well seems to be made up of um, maybe bricks or maybe um, rocks. It has a lot of um, weeds and tall grass growing around it. It's got some flagstones around it and the rope seems to be quite frayed. It's tied to what looks like maybe a rusted tin bucket. Uh, there's a crank to the side and the structure itself is also overgrown with weeds. And again, in this sketch as well, there is a pigeon. Only one pigeon this time. It's uh, sitting on the side of the well, uh, looking out. There's some leaves strewn on the ground and generally just looks like a well which has not been used in a while. This chapter, as, um, as a starting to it, I do want to mention something is this chapter always used to have a much greater meaning for me as I grew up, as I went past my teens and I was approaching my 20s because it starts to look into this whole discovery of parents being as fallible human beings as us. All throughout our childhood, they are the one person we run to who gives us comfort, who gives us security um, and everything that we need. And so we put them on these really high pedestals where they can do no wrong. They um, cannot take any wrong decisions. Everything they do is correct. And then after your teenage years, as you yourself start to interact more with the outside world, you start seeing them for who they really are. You start seeing them as human beings who are trying their best and who are trying to make the best decisions with the amount of information they have at hand. And I think it's a beautiful process that uh, you develop a much deeper relationship with your parents at that time. And this chapter definitely delves into some of that. So it is in that sense a very beautiful chapter at the beginning. So with that, Let's start the second chapter. The school that was chosen eventually was an Anglican convent of which Cousin Galis, safely out of reach on the Atlantic, would have violently disapproved. My mother, indeed, made her protest. Leaning out of my bedroom window one summer evening, I overheard my parents talking beside the open window of my father's study just below me. My daughter to be brought up by nuns? Absurd. That was my mother. She's my daughter too. That's what you think, said my mother, so softly that I barely caught it. I heard him laugh. I said he was a saint, and he adored her, always. It never occurred to him to interpret what she said as another man might have done. I know, my dear. She has your brains, and one day she may have a little of your beauty. But I have some claim to her, too. Remember what the old sexton used to say? My mother knew when she had gone too far, and never fought a rearguard action. I heard the smile in her voice. Thee cannot deny thyself, O oh, that one, vicar? And neither you can, dear Harry. She's lucky there. To have got your dark hair and those grey eyes that I always said were far too beautiful to be wasted on a man. Very well. 
The convent does seem good enough, if the prospectus is anything to go by. But there's this other one. Where's the booklet got to? Uh, um, this sounds just as good, and not much dearer. But much farther away. Devonshire? Think of the train fares. Don't worry, my dear. I know these places are not renowned for scholarship, but that's what I meant. They may try to turn her out religious. My father sounded amused. That's hardly something you can expect me to condemn. She laughed. I'm sorry. I put it badly. But you know what I mean. One hears so much about religious teaching being emphasized at the expense of other subjects, especially sciences, and I think that's where Jilly's interests will lie. She's quick and she's got a good brain. She needs good teaching and hard work and competition. I should know. That's the part of her that's like me. Her voice grew fainter as she turned away from the window. I heard him murmur something in reply and then a snatch or two that... Craning from my window, I just managed to catch something from my father about the county school and only two stations down the line and an emphatic speech from my mother, which I could not hear, but which I had heard so often that I could supply every word. Her daughter to go to school with the village children, bad enough that she had to attend the primary, but to go to the local county school till she was 17 or 18, to end up with all the wrong friends and an accent like the miner's children? Never! It was the protest of a lonely woman sealed tightly in her own narrow social sphere, an attitude which for those days was not outrageous and was indeed common enough fostered in my mother's case by the isolated colonial upbringing with its dreams of home, still coloured by the standards of Victoria. It was also, as I knew even then, the voice of frustrated ambition. My mother's daughter, never my father's on these occasions, must have the chances which had been withheld from her own generation. Her daughter must have independence, the freedom that only education could give her to choose her own line of life. The higher education at that, a university degree, and a good one. A first? Why not? Of that, and how much more would her daughter be capable? And so on. I could guess it all, and with it my father's invariable protest. He was as Victorian in his way as she that a daughter, a beautiful daughter, would surely get married and find in that way the greatest happiness, the only happiness and true fulfilment a woman could know. If Jilly had been a boy, then a public school and university by all means, but for a daughter, surely quite unnecessary. My mother was back at the window again, her voice clear and sharp, too sharp. This was no longer theory. The hope was about to be realised, and in the heat of actual decision, she was less than tactful. And if she doesn't qualify to earn her own living and get out of here, who will she ever meet that's fit for her to marry? Do you really want her to stay at home and become just the vicar's daughter, the parish drudge? Like the vicar's wife? asked my father very sadly. Looking back now, after a lifetime... I can see past my own unhappiness to what must have been my mother's. Ambitious, beautiful, clever, and with that spark of manipulative magic that we call witchcraft dormant in her, she must have been worn down bit by bit by poverty and hard work and the loneliness induced by my father's absorption in parish affairs and by the whole world of distance between herself and her own people in New Zealand, by disappointment too. My father, contented in his work, even in his poverty, would never push his way into the higher clerical spheres which she would have delighted in and adorned. I did not think about it then. I just knew that some unhappiness unexpressed lay between my parents, 
in spite of their deep affection for one another. After a pause, she said in a voice I hardly recognized, I have all I want, Harry, all I have ever wanted. You know that. A short silence, then she went on, but gently now. I hope Galis will have it too, some day. But we have to face the fact that she may never marry and that we can leave her nothing. Not even a home, I know. You are right as usual. This offer of Galis's is a godsend. Yes, whatever she might want to call it, a godsend. Well, what about it? Can you reconcile yourself to the convent? Your fears may have no foundation. The entrance examination did look a pretty stiff one to me. I suppose so. Yes, all right. But, oh dear, a convent? It's the cheapest, said my father simply. And that seemingly clinched it. For to the convent I was sent. It was a gaunt place. Near the sea cliffs on the east coast, and my mother hardly need have worried that the good nuns would have any undue influence over me. The good nuns, indeed, believed in what they called self-government in the school, which meant merely that a form leader was selected, the biggest and toughest and most popular girl in the form, and that all discipline, including punishment, was in her control and that of her second usually her closest friend and crony. As a system to save trouble for the nuns, it may have had something to recommend it. From the point of view of a shy and studious child, it was the stuff of a lifetime's nightmares. I arrived at school with a reputation for being clever, fostered by that stiff entrance examination which I passed with ease and was put by the good sisters into a class of girls at least two years older than I was. Scholarship not being a forte of the convent, I was soon head of that class, and longing for approbation, and therefore working harder than ever, I no doubt richly deserved the jealous dislike which was presently meted out to me. I was eight years old with no defences, School became a place of torment and misery. The days were awful enough. The nights in the dormitories were a hell of teasing and torture. We, the bullied and tormented children, certainly never dreamed of complaining. The punishment for that, in the unsupervised classrooms and dormitories, would have been too horrific. Each evening after Compline, the silent file of nuns would pass through the junior dormitory, heads bent, veils hiding their faces, arms in their sleeves looking neither to right nor left at the beds where, still and apparently asleep, lay torturers and tortured, waiting till the door closed before the nightmare began again. Even at home I told no one, least of all at home. My childhood had conditioned me to unhappiness, to not believing I was wanted, to fear. So I lived through term after wretched term, my only resort being books and the security of the working classroom, where, of course, I went even further ahead of the bigger girls who bullied me. The only gleam of light and love was the thought of the holidays. Not the bleak boredom of the vicarage, or even the gentle companionship of my father, but the single-minded love of my dog Rover. Too single-minded. He loved, obeyed, and followed no one but me. My mother put up with our joyous partnership for something over a year. While I was away, he stayed tied up. She would not walk him. So when she released him at all, he vanished into fields and village, looking for me. She was, she, was, she said once, afraid he might become a sheep warrior. So at the end of one term, I came home from school to be told that he had gone. That was all. It may be hard now for modern children to understand that I did not dare even ask how or when. I said nothing. 
I did not even dare let her see me crying. This time, no one blotted my tears. The birds and mice, the rabbit, the beloved dog, I did not try again. I stayed within myself and endured, as silently as I could, until again help came. It came in a strange and roundabout way. It was discovered, foolish and innocent as I was, I had confided in someone, that I believed in magic. I was young for my years, still barely ten years old, and these Myths and legends of the classics and the Norsemen, the stories of Andrew Lang and Hans Andersen and Grimm still trailed their clouds of glory through my imagination. And it must be admitted, also, that the church-haunted life I led, with its miracles and legends and its choirs of angels, conspired with fairyland to make another world both real and probable. So it was rumoured that little Jilly Ramsey believed in fairies. It was the senior girls, kinder than my own contemporaries, who hatched a plot. Rather sweet, they said, and wrote tiny notes for me from the fairy queen. Then they hid and watched me steal out and pick these up from a sundial which stood in a neglected part of the school garden. I do not remember now how it started, nor how much I believed, but it was a happy secret and seemed to mean me no harm. I would take the little letter, then run off into the wood, there was no privacy anywhere within doors, to read it and write my reply. The last time it happened was in early June, about the middle of my second summer term. There was the note, tucked into the mossy stone. The minute writing said merely, Dear Jilly, in your last letter you were wishing you had a fairy godmother. I'm sure you will be hearing from one soon, your Queen Titania. What they had planned for me I was never to know. Something, a sound, a movement made me look up. Behind the bushes I saw the crouching forms of the girls who had perpetrated the hoax. I got to my feet. I cannot now remember what I felt or what I intended to do, but at that moment the voice of one of my form mates called my name from the edge of the garden. Jilly! Jilly Ramsey! I'm here. There's a letter for you. The stocky figure of Alice Bundle, one of my fellow sufferers, and as such, something approximating to a friend, came running down the path waving a letter. I did not look towards the bushes. I said very clearly, Thanks a lot, Alice. Oh yes, I know the writing. It's from my godmother. I was expecting it. She's going to take me away from here. I crumpled the fairy queen's note, threw it to the ground, and ran back into school. The senior girls straightened as I passed them. One of them called out something, but I took no notice. I was buoyed up by the first defiance of my childhood, the first deliberate lie, the first don't-care attitude I had dared to take. I left the older girls staring after me. They must have thought that their false magic had somehow worked for me. It had. The letter, as I had expected, was from my mother. It was the day when her weekly letter invariably arrived. It started with the same name she used for me when she was pleased about something. Dear Gillyflower, your cousin Galis is home now and came to see us on Friday. She was not at all pleased when she found out what school you had been sent to. Since she is putting up most of the money for your board, we have to give in to her wishes and she wants you taken away from the convent. You will have to sit for another entrance scholarship, but I have no doubt you will get it. See that you do. The new school is in the Lake District, and I hope its record for scholarship is better than your convent, since, as you know, you will have to earn your own living every penny of it. Blessed Cousin Galus, or rather, 
since she would have spurned that objective. Beloved cousin Galis, I could and would start again. End of chapter 2